coming up next at Jam. Tonight, weary, worn out, and weak, dozens of flood-stricken victims still lining up for help. I'm Jeff Begay's in Broward County. The rain is coming down again. You hear the thunder and lightning. Behind me, residents dealing with flooded-out homes, and they feel snubbed by federal officials. I'll tell you about that. Also, a happy reunion story with all the destruction. And as those small here in the Weather Center, flood warnings continue for Broward and Miami-Dade County. Another stormy night. I'll have the complete forecast. Also, a major break in the case of a missing South Florida girl. And just one station with the one clue police have to go on. It was a beating on the ice no hockey fan will forget. Now tonight, the victim is playing in South Florida. On the same day, his attacker learns his fate. The 19th lie. The day after the makings of a revolution. A fallen leader in hiding no more. And now, ready to concede. And a police camera catching a horrifying accident involving a young bike rider. I'm Laurie Jennings. And I'm Rick Sanchez. We're going to have these stories and a lot more on this Friday night edition of 7 News First in Town. Now, live on the news station, this is 7 News at 10. Tonight, help finally here for the thousands of South Florida residents who are still either stranded or extremely hungry. The federal government now on a mission of mercy. But the danger isn't over yet. As we speak, most of South Florida once again under a flood warning. As we go through another round of rain tonight, these are live pictures from Sweetwater where they simply can't take any more of this. Here's what folks in Broward want to know. Does that mission of mercy from Uncle Sam extend to them? Some complaining today that FEMA wasn't responding to their needs. And with more rain tonight, they do have plenty of needs. Hello again, everybody. Tonight, the last thing South Florida needed is exactly what it's got. More rain. In fact, as we begin this newscast, that's exactly what we're getting with parts of South Florida dealing with yet another flood warning. Tonight's storm striking both Dade and Broward counties. Now, this is a light show that was coming in from Hialeah tonight. Now, let's get right to our night team coverage. We're going to begin with meteorologist Bill Kamal just to put us in on what's been happening tonight, Bill. You know, Rick, this is not tropical in nature like we had with that unclassified system on Tuesday. This is ahead of a strong front that is going to change our weather late Sunday and Sunday night. But again, another round of rain came through. Flood warnings will expire for East Central Dade County at 10:15, but they'll hold for Northeast Broward, uh, Northeast Dade, I'm sorry, and Southeast Broward County until 11:15. And more coming out of Broward County. We've got some videotape from Davey shot earlier, and again, very strong thunderstorms in some areas of Broward and Dave were the hardest hit on Tuesday. They got the heaviest rains again today. Doppler estimates two to four inches in Miami Dade County, one to three inches so far in southeast Broward County, and it's still raining hard. Now, the wider Doppler view, and I want to show you what came out of parts of south central Florida toward us, and that area is sinking to the south and east. Go back to source two, and I want to show you this. Now, this area is coming out of the, uh, can we go to the other source, source number two? Thank you. And this area coming out of southeast Florida now, the heaviest activity heading into the Atlantic Ocean. These storms will be dying down, but not before. More rains come in this evening, but the actual front is still well up to our north, and the temperatures behind the front cooling off rather dramatically, and it will be a tail of two seasons this weekend. Hot, humid air tomorrow, and then more rain with the front, and it could be some rain on Sunday, then getting windy and cooler. Complete forecast in a few minutes. All right, well, that's what it looks like outside on the, I should say, that's what it looks like on the radar. Now let's see what it looks like outside. The 19th Brian Andrews is standing by live in Sweetwater for the pushers on to get food and water to all these flood victims. All as they deal with another night of terrifying lightning and a lot of downpours, Brian. It was really bad out here tonight, Lori. We had lightning for at least an hour and a half and then a torrential uh, downpour. And as you can see, it's still coming down here on the streets of Sweetwater. It seems like the water has gone back up in some areas. And now I want to take you to another camera at the Relief Center where they've been handing out supplies. And from our camera there, you can see that the relief tent actually became a storm casualty tonight as the winds came down and took part of the tent, causing it to collapse. And uh, some of the uh, relief supplies got wet. It is a mess, mess out here, and, and FEMA is doing its best, along with local officials, to give folks some sense of hope. Night sky opening up, unleashing more rain on areas of Miami-Dade still dealing with floodwaters. Water pumps operating at full capacity, moving thousands of gallons of flood water into the sewer system and out into Biscayne Bay. 
Miami-Dade police still have many streets blocked off as they keep an eye on the fluctuating water levels. Out in this mess, the National Guard bearing Miami-Dade fire rescue and police in the flooded neighborhood where they're checking on everyone's well-being. Hi, how you doing? Hi, Wearing hip waders, the fire rescue and police officers go door to door in a driving rain. Are you okay? Stop and make a there is a lot of wet ground to cover. The city of West Miami hit hard as well. Blood water's still high. Cars going nowhere. Most roads still blocked off. The best way to get around this mess, on a bulldozer. This ride, courtesy of the chief of police. We, we think we saw hurricanes and storms, but this is the worst. And it's very devastating to these are our, our family. And it hurts. It's gone. I mean, this is, you know, that's pretty depressing for people. A lot of these people are still in their homes. They don't want to leave. They're scared to leave their property. So, you know, this is uh, something that we're going to have to work on and uh, see what we can do. With FEMA, we screen people to determine whether they're eligible for a loan or they need a grant. The grants will cover damage to your home, to your apartment, loss of personal property, uh, as well as businesses, big and small. So uh, very low interest loans, 4% or less, long term, 30 years. Uh, and it could go to 200000 just to replace your home. And back in Sweetwater now with live pictures from 109th Avenue and 4th Street, very close to City Hall, which is flooded out as well. Again, the hope that the people here in this community have is going to be coming from FEMA. Again, as you heard in our story tonight, there is a lot of federal money that's available. And if you need that federal money, you need to get on the phone to that special 800 number that we've been showing you all day long. That we'll again show you during this newscast to FEMA so they can talk to you and figure out how to assess and meet your needs. Live in Sweetwater, Brian Andrews, 7 News, 19. And from you, Brian, we head north now to the 19th Jeff Gaze in Pembroke Park. The yeah, residents there wondering tonight why the federal government hasn't responded to their needs the way they did in Dave. Jeff? Well, the federal government has. FEMA will provide aid to these residents here. Residents who are, as you can see behind me, flooded out as well. However, residents have been watching the pictures of FEMA officials touring Miami-Dade County, and they're wondering why those officials haven't toured Broward County, Pembroke Park, where we are tonight. However, they have gotten a lot of help from the Red Cross, and that itself has turned into a happy reunion for two people. It is nightfall at this Broward trailer park, and some residents are doing major repair work to their homes. The plywood will be this woman's floor. Both bedrooms are floor sunk, so we have to change the whole flooring. And so we're, we're, what they had was concentrated wood, and when it gets wet, it soaks and explodes. So all the furniture sunk. This isn't the first time floodwaters have caused some of the floors around here to collapse. It happened last year, too. We're the only neighborhood that gets stuck with all this water, and every year, and it's getting worse and worse, and I don't understand it. I don't know why anyone, does, why somebody doesn't do something about it. For now, residents are relying on help from volunteers from both Navy and Coast Guard vessels participating in Fleet Week. This is an opportunity of people. I mean, well, I'm in the Coast Guard, that's, that's what we do. Also, the Red Cross is delivering supplies. But in the case of Margaret Brenner and Flo Tabor Brown, they are delivering something more. We had a great couple of days. Flo was going door to door with the Red Cross when she came across Margaret, a flood victim. This thing says, is this your trailer over here? And I said, yes, this is Brenner to name her. I said, yes, this is my mother's maiden name was Brenner. I said, you're kidding. And I started to ask him where the she was from. But she asked me first where I was from. I said, Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And I said, well, gee, do you know Kelly Brenner? And she said, she's my sister. And I went, she's my mother's cousin. That makes us cousins. So that's how the whole story happened. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't What's believe the chances it. of that happening? You know, to me, that's like a modern-day miracle. A miracle reunion for two long-lost cousins. It is a bright spot in an ordeal that for so many here has been bleak. That was the good news. It's raining again here, and it's raining hard. We're soaked standing out here. And it's raining as they keep pumping the water out. Everyone here is hoping for some good news. 
We're live in Pembroke Park, Jeff Begay, 7 News 19. All right, Jeff, we'll certainly get back to you if we need to. And the flood of trouble still having a major effect on schools. Got thousands of students. Go ahead, Lori. They can still, they cannot return to class at this point because of the flooding and all the standing water. And it doesn't look like the game plan is quite together yet for next week. We can tell you, though, school officials are hoping to have all public schools up and running by Tuesday. As you know, Monday, public schools are closed anyway for Columbus Day. That'll give them one more day to get busy. Stay tuned over the weekend for the final word on that. And a warning for beachgoers tonight. The Florida Department of Health advising people to stay out of the water along some Biscayne Bay beaches. Test results are confirming at this point that windsurfer north and south, as well as Hobie Beach, have increased levels of bacteria due to sewage runoff from all of this week's flooding. There is a major clue tonight in the case of a missing South Florida teen who vanished without a trace over the weekend. A friend discovering the 18-year-old's car outside a sports bar, and tonight her father is reacting to the news. My team's Charles Belay is working the story for us from Tampa. Charles? Rick, this is a huge piece of the puzzle for police, and this girl's family is actually crediting the public with its discovery. But despite the fact that the car has been found, the community continues tonight to rally around this family. It's a big question for police. Could a business in this Tamarack shopping center be the linchpin in the disappearance of 18-year-old Colleen Paris? Friday afternoon, detectives finding Paris's white Mazda abandoned in the parking lot, and it could provide detectives with clues. From what I understand, there's a lot of, a lot of personal items in the car, so hopefully once we look at those after it's processed, we can come up with some sort of a clue as to where she could have possibly gone or to, as to her whereabouts. Paris disappearing last Saturday afternoon. Father Nick and Mother Nancy immediately printing flyers and going house to house distributing their daughter's picture, asking for information. And today, they got it. I mean, it's one of the things we've, we've been having the flyers. We've been trying to find her in the car, obviously. Finding the car gives us at least a head start now. But Colleen's father has no idea why the car would be abandoned but does admit Colleen's love of sports may explain why she visited the shopping center. What her friends told me uh, was that there's a sports bar there with uh, pool tables and, and darts, and that's something my daughter uh, has a passion for. This woman works nearby the Paris family postal and shipping business and did Colleen's nails the day before she disappeared. Well, how did she, how is she missing so fast? You know, it's like Friday, I'm touching her, and the next day she's, she's gone and no one knows where she's at. Yeah, I'm trying to get in touch with you. Dave Girardi does business with Colleen's father and donated $1,000 in reward money for information in the case and is asking others to join the effort. What we'd like to do is really solicit a lot of the, you know, any corporations in South Florida as well as individuals that are interested in donating to this uh, reward fund. The amount of support from the community is overwhelming for Colleen's family. The, the people out there were the eyes and the ears for us and we found the car now one more step we found my daughter. Well, right now, that car is in the possession of plantation police, and detectives are going through it right now, trying to find anything they can to get a handle on this case. We're live in Tamarack, Charles Bullock, 7 News, 19. A blaze on a luxurious sailboat causing a quarter of a million dollars in damage. Seven Sky Force over the scene in Port Lauderdale this morning. The blame charring the 57-foot boat docked behind a home in, Il in Isla Bahia. No one was on board at the time of the fire. Tonight, investigators are still trying to figure out the cause. Flames are so scorching a South Florida home. The blaze breaking out along Southwest 61st Avenue and 62nd Street in South Miami this morning. The mother coming home to one big charred mess. I, I dropped the kids off to school and I went to get my mom from work and they, they said to, I needed to rush home because there was an emergency here. I, and when I got here, I saw it like this. Luckily, no one was home at the time. Investigators say the fire started in the kitchen, most likely, because the stove was left on. And tonight, some road debris causing double trouble for drivers on the highways. The first incident on I-95 near Atlantic Boulevard in Pompano Beach. A waste management truck's drive shaft broke off, sending the pieces slamming into other cars. Five vehicles were damaged in all this. Luckily, no one was hurt, though. And then in Davie, the same thing happening to another dump truck on I-595 near Pine Island Road. Three cars damaged there, but again, no one injured. This is one that could set up historic trend. The verdict is in tonight for a professional hockey player on trial for assaulting another player on the ice in the middle of a game. The weapon, his hockey stick. The verdict, guilty. Now tonight, the player who suffered the blow is in South Florida playing against the Panthers. This one's controversial. The 19th Mikey Pasquale is live at the arena with reaction to the verdict. Mike. 
Well, Rick, first of all, news around the South Florida area for hockey fans, of course, involves the Panthers hosting the Canucks in a regular season home opener. But news around the NHL today centers on Molly McSorley, the ex-Boston Bruin, who was found guilty of assault with a weapon, his hockey stick, on Canucks' Donald Brashear. Now, Brashear was in the lineup tonight. In fact, he scored a goal. Back to McSorley, who insisted in court the blow that sent the Canucks forward to the ice last season was not meant for his head. But a Canadian judge disagreed, saying the assault was intentional. Brashear says a verdict doesn't concern him. No, I, uh, like I said, I have no uh, personal feelings. And uh, uh, Marty uh, did something. Uh, something happened to him. And, uh, and uh, that's what was decided. And uh, that is not my fault. And uh, I'm just glad everything's over with. Now, McSorley, who faced a year and a half in jail, won't do any jail time, but he does have 18 months of probation. During that time, he cannot play against Brashear, but McSorley has been suspended indefinitely, and as a result, if and when, McSorley is ever reinstated by the NHL. We are more from Brashear, and of course, highlights of tonight's Panther Canucks game later on in sports. For now, I'm Mike DePasquale, live at the NCR Center. Back to you, Lord. All right, thank you, Mike. And the people have spoken and won all the riots we showed you yesterday in the streets of Yugoslavia's capital even waiting celebration tonight after the country's president concedes defeat on state TV. The night team's Holly Herbert is live at the Satellite Center now with all the details. Holly? Well, Lori, it is all over for Slobodan Milosevic, who has tonight admitted defeat in last month's election. The concession had President Clinton vowing to quickly work to lift sanctions against Yugoslavia. That is, until Milosevic stated he wasn't going far. I wish to all citizens of Yugoslavia a lot of success. Slobodan Milosevic says goodbye to the people of Yugoslavia during a televised address Friday night. It came hours after the country's high court reversed a decision it made two days ago, ruling Milosevic had indeed lost last month's election to Vojislav Kushtunica. That decision was made by a body with the constitutional right to decide, and that decision must be respected. The court changing its mind a day after protesters angry at Milosevic for clinging to power stormed parliament. And his resignation is sending people back into the streets, this time in celebration. Now I want to just live in a free country and I want to be a part of the world. And I think, I don't know, this is absolutely the most wonderful thing that could happen. Still, even after admitting an election defeat, Milosevic refuses to stay down, announcing he'll be back to try to carve a rollout for himself in Yugoslav political life. That, however, could affect plans by the United States and European leaders now offering to lift sanctions against Yugoslavia. I think it would be a terrible mistake for him to remain active in the political life of the country. That is not what the people voted for. The president is also calling for Milosevic to face war crimes charges although one U.S. official says the administration is choosing its words carefully, hoping not to create problems for the opposition. So there are plenty of details left to be played out. Milosevic's future is still unclear. The people of Yugoslavia tonight, though, are rejoicing his reign is over. President-elect Kuchunica is expected to be sworn in tomorrow. Live in the Satellite Center, Holly Herbert, Southern News 19. Let's take it out of the other trouble spot in the world. Mayhem continues breaking out of the Middle East, where several Palestinian groups have declared the day as a, quote, day of rage in Jerusalem. Israeli police clashing with Palestinians at the Temple Mount. Leaders from both sides are their military forces to separate at several hotspots in the confrontation. Nine days of violence have left more than 70 people dead already, most of them. Palestinians. And just in off the satellites, an, uh, an Aeromexico plane attempting to land in Reynosa, Mexico, turns deadly. This is right near the Texas border. Officials say the plane apparently overshot the runway, slamming into two homes and then nose diving into a canal. The woman and her three children inside one of those homes were all killed. Five people were injured, including a flight attendant. But we're told no one aboard the plane was killed. Officials say pilots lost contact with the control tower shortly before that crash. Other stories that we will bring in about from the night team, strong currents, leaving three boys in serious danger, and the rescue is just as dangerous. You will see it all. I'm Lynn Martinez, uh, live in the 7 News Flex. A police officer responding to a car slamming into a teenager riding his bike. Could this tragedy have been avoided?
the story coming up. A violent earthquake jolting Japan. The damage extensive. And the picture's frightening. We'll have it all for you. A wreck on the rails in the coastal Florida city now being called a case of sabotage. Also ahead, a very special football fan with a lifelong dream. So will it come true this weekend? And a South Beach chef serving up quesadillas. This is not your average quesadilla, folks. Get ready for a bite with wealth for the big show. Come back at you. You are watching 7 News at 10 with Roy Jennings, Rick Sanchez, meteorologist Bill Camo with weather, and Mike DiVasquale with sports. 7 News brought to you in part by Rooms to Go. Decorate with one simple decision for less than you ever thought possible. Monday on 7 News, they eat candy, popcorn, and cookies. But how can you make sure your child gets the nutrition they need? A daily dose of vitamins could be the answer. So which ones are right for your child? We'll get the vital facts on vitamins in Kids and Vitamins. Plus, they have a piece of political history, memories of a popular president. That is John Kennedy's signature. So how much is their presidential property worth? Find out in Trash or Treasure, Monday starting first at 5 on 7 News. Closed caption brought to you in part by City Furniture, the ultimate furniture store. Police cruiser's dash cam capturing a crash on camera. The car slams into a teen biking through an intersection. Now, as you can see in the video, the young victim never saw the car coming. But according to police, the officer did have a green light and the right of way. The tragedy happening in Boynton Beach in the 19th, Lynn Martinez is live in the Plex now to pick up the story from here. Lynn? Well, of course, accidents do happen, and you are about to see one take place. Now, the videotape doesn't show the actual impact, but you can see for yourself how this whole thing went down. The police officer inside this cruiser is responding to an accident, but is then told he is not needed. Does a U-turn on Federal Highway to travel north, about the 900 block of uh, South Federal Highway? and heads north up to Northeast 26th Ave where the alarm and open door has been discovered at the temple. As the officer approaches the intersection at Boynton Beach Boulevard, the light is green. The officer says, though, his vision is obstructed by cars in the turning lanes. With the green light, he drives through the intersection. That's when a 13-year-old boy on a bicycle suddenly is right in front of him. The car hits the boy. The boy hits the windshield and is thrown from the car and hits a bus bench before hitting the ground. Police are not saying who may be at fault, but the officer clearly does have the right of way. Well, we've confirmed our earlier, our initial review that showed that the officer was traveling northbound through the intersection of North Federal Highway and Boynton Beach Boulevard through a green light. Even though the officer had the green light, he was driving 10 miles over the speed limit, and his lights and siren may or may not have been on. I don't have a specific policy that states when you respond to type A call, type B call, type C call, you'll respond lights, lights and siren. Um, he has a, he has the right of the way in the intersection, so he's proceeding through the intersection as any one of us would. So again, there seem to have been several mistakes. The officer was speeding and the bicyclist crossed when he shouldn't have and was not wearing a helmet. The bicyclist remains in serious condition. In the Newsplex, Lynn Martinez, 7 News, 19. And from the Boynton Beach accident there to Miami Beach, we have breaking news now of a car accident that was also caught on camera. Yeah, this one just coming in. Holly Herbert's got information on it. What do you know, Holly? Well, uh, we are just getting this one in. Apparently, uh, a paparazzi uh, photographer caught this uh, all on camera. Uh, it all happened on South Beach today when uh, the Latin uh, pop star Cheyenne uh, was uh, apparently uh, coming out of um, some building and going into a limo when a car loses control on Washington Avenue, hits a light pole, then another car, and then lands in a construction site after going through a fence. All of this caught on camera. The good thing is, is that uh, nobody was hurt in all this. It's uh, not exactly clear what role uh, the uh, Latin pop star played in all this. I don't think anything. I was thinking possibly maybe the driver was, uh, you know, had uh, diverted uh, the attention. But um, the good thing in all of this is that uh, nobody was hurt. That's it from the news desk. All right. Some pretty amazing pictures. We thank you, Holly. Meanwhile, tonight, 
Detectives say that a wreck on the rails in South Florida was sabotaged, and they're now offering a reward to find out who was behind it. A U.S. sugar train slamming into several parked railroad cars in Belgrade last week after being diverted to a sidetrack. The company is now offering a $20,000 reward to find out who's responsible. The estimated damage, nearly a million dollars. Three boys in Indiana in desperate need of help after strong currents pulled their raft in every direction. Rescuers trying to get the boys out of the water when they suddenly fell in. Crews then throwing the teens a rope and managing to pull them to safety. Luckily, all did escape unharmed. Wow. Other stories that we're going to be following for you on this night, a violent earthquake. Look at these pictures where it strikes the thing. It's found landslides and demolishes several homes. Also, a South Florida youngster and big-time football fan hoping to live out his dream. That story is ahead. Also ahead, a scrumptious seafood appetizer. South Beach style. The recipe is straight from a popular chef's kitchen. Strap on the feedback, folks. We got a bite. And live pictures from Sweetwater, where floodwaters simply won't go away. And tonight's rain, and even more rain, could be on the way for them. We'll be back. 7 News, brought to you in part by DreamWorks Pictures, The Contender, in theaters everywhere October 13th. Closed captioning brought to you in part by All Broward Hurricane, America's oldest and largest manufacturer of hurricane protection products. Call 1-800-HURRICANE. A very hard football fan hoping for a chance to see his favorite team. Now tonight, he's one step closer to his dream. This is a spirited football fan devoted to the Florida State Seminoles. And now, this young fan is gearing up for the thrill of a lifetime this very weekend. The right view, Christine Cruz, explains. Meet A.J. Jones. He wasn't expecting us on this morning. But when 7 News showed up, he was wearing his Florida State jersey. Nothing staged about this fan. He's the real thing. I always liked the Florida State when I was a little boy. At 14, A.J. is also a quadriplegic. He was riding a bicycle in North Florida and got hit by um, a truck. It happened in Tallahassee nearly four years ago. The spunky little boy seen here striking a pose for the camera would never walk again. The accident leaving him paralyzed from the neck down. Yeah, take away seven. AJ can't go to school. School comes to him by way of a conference call with a teacher and several other physically challenged students. Despite all he's been through, AJ still has spirit especially when it comes to football and his favorite team. He's had photo ops with some of his favorite players at the hospital. He even has a football signed by FSU coach Bobby Bowden. He got it for Christmas last year. But what he's never had... I've never got to go to the game, but I watch all these games. I know his... Um, the biggest dream would be to meet some of the teammates, the team players, and um, coach by the violence. <laughs> Just a couple of days after our first interview with AJ, we dropped by again, this time with some good news. I have something here actually for you from the University of Miami. I'm going to open it for you, okay? All right. You got a couple of tickets to the game this Saturday. What do you think? <laughs> so after all he's been through, AJ finally catches a break. He's still a diehard FSU fan. Who is going to win Saturday's game? Um, I'm going with Florida State. But he will admit, by donating these tickets, the Hurricanes have scored, even in his book. So, uh, yeah, just to say thank you, and let's see. <laughs> I think I'm playing my team. I was, oh, we, 
<laughs> they weren't playing your favorite CBB yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> In Carroll City, I'm Christine Cruz, 7 News. Mm. Gotta like the spark, huh? Oh, yeah. And we will see you at the game, AJ. Mm. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, tonight, we're following a development story. We just got information on this one. Another one. Boy, it seems to happen a lot on Friday nights around here. A train and a car collide. This one's an accident on Northwest Miami Dade. We're following it for you. Also ahead, an island nation jolted by a powerful earthquake, one of the strongest in years. We'll have the frightening scenes coming in off the satellite. Daredevil pilot flying low for a chance at aviation history. The pictures are coming up. And one of the most celebrated chefs on South Beach sharing his secret for one pretty awesome appetizer. Now you can make it too as we sit down for a bite with Duffy. 7 News brought to you in part by Holman Lincoln Mercury. Same family ownership for 76 years. And by Bears for the best quality furniture and interior design. Tomorrow on the Saturday edition of Today in Florida, find out how you can hook up to a new Fox show online. It all starts at 6 o'clock. Join us. Nothing better on our big football weekend than a platter of appetizers. And now you can whip up your own hors d'oeuvres or pussy d'oeuvres, as some call them using recipes from a famous South Florida restaurant. So, grab a pen and a paper and get ready for a bite with balconies. The chef, Alex Brueger, from Ocean Drive's famous Mango's Tropical Cafe. The meal, blackened lobster quesadillas with fresh mango salsa and Cayman rock shrimp fritters. So this is kind of a little appetizer action, little party. Something you can make at home, 30 minutes or less, and find in any grocery store. The steps. Slice your lobster tail in half and take out the meat. Then slice the tail to open it up as much as possible. Add your blackening seasoning. If you don't have it, you can make your own. You can take several of your favorite herbs and spices. You can have uh, ginger, turmeric, paprika, chili powder, whatever you might, uh, whatever you might like. Saute the lobster in a pan, then add your diced green peppers, red peppers, yellow peppers, red onions, and scallions. While the lobster and the vegetables cook, heat up your tortilla in a separate pan and add cheese on top. So so don't, don't be cheap with your cheese, right? Then deglaze the lobster vegetable pan with some white wine and the juice from half a lime. Remove the tortilla from the pan, slice your lobster, and place the meat in the middle. Put your veggies on top, fold the tortilla over, cut it into slices, place it on a dish, and serve it with a fresh mango salsa. One appetizer down, one to go. For your Cayman rock shrimp fritters, make your batter by combining flour, baking soda, sugar, one egg, milk, or buttermilk, the rock shrimp, celery, scallions, garlic, red pepper, and chopped jalapenos. Mix it up, then use an ice cream scooper to drop the batter into the oil. The batter will fall to the bottom, then rise to the top when it's ready. Chef Alex lets the fritters drain on a paper towel. He garnishes a plate, then serves them with some cocktail sauce on the side. Now, the next time someone asks who catered your party, you tell them you did. You know, you don't have to use lobster for the quesadillas. You can use crab meat, you can use shrimp, even chicken if you like. And for the fritters, you can use conch, you can use calamari. You've got all kinds of options, darling. All of those options are listed at www.wsvn.com. You know that's where you can get the recipe if you have the computer. If you don't, you can still get it by sending in a self-addressed stamped envelope to the address there on your screen, and we'll make sure to get those recipes out to you so you can get started in the kitchen. Bon appetit, everybody. I'm Belky Murray, 7 News, 19. Mm -hmm. And when it's football, you're allowed to have grease and cheese and fatty stuff. I'll right? take the Doritos, the Castillos, <laughs> and all the... Uh, take it all. Cheese, yeah. Still ahead tonight, we first showed you some of these images last night. A powerful earthquake jolting Japan, the tremor caught on cameras, and now we see the damage is extensive. We'll have details. Pilots making aviation history overseas for daring flights. Caught on camera, we are coming back. still reeling after a major earthquake strikes that happened in the southwestern part of the country, injuring nearly 28 people. Officials calling it the strongest tremor there in five years. Several homes, skyscrapers, and businesses all shattered by the 7.3 tremor, and a lot of places left without electricity. The tremor also triggering several landslides. 
Also, it's about a daring mission making aviation history. Six pilots fly their homemade planes under a 20-foot bridge. The pilots are approached a small arch with more than uh, 45 miles per hour, and there they go. Right underneath, no problem. Ow. They took just half a second to fly under it. Any more, and we would have seen an accident. The flights took place in China as part of a 2000 Air Sports Federation World Grand Prix of Aviation. Boy, that's a mouthful. Now, time for 7 Weather with Bill Gamal. Well, 7 Storms can take you into Broward County in the same areas that got such heavy rains on Tuesday. Hallandale, down to Aventura, North Miami Beach, and just north of Bell Harbor. This is the heaviest cell right now. Everything is moving off to the south and to the east, but there's more moderate rain. Here's Doppler radar now, and I'll show you that we do have a little bit more to come. These reds and yellows up around parts of southeast Broward County still coming in on this north west airflow from northwest to southeast. What we had actually is a trough of low pressure develop ahead of a pretty strong front that is going to be making its way through Florida over the next couple of days, so over this weekend. And the big rains from the actual front now over north Florida and the thunderstorms that developed ahead of it today causing all these problems. More to come tomorrow. 50s and 60s behind the front. We will have another hot, humid day from Orlando to Miami and Key West with sunshine giving way to storms along and near the frontal boundary. Then the front may take much of Sunday to go through, but when it does, the winds will start increasing out of the northeast, and the winds are going to be the factor. As this cold Arctic air plunges southward, tapping some of the moisture left over from Keith across the Gulf Coast, and by Sunday night and Monday, Columbus Day, windy, noticeably cooler, and unsettled. So my forecast for the weekend, it's a split decision for tonight. The heavy downpours will continue till around midnight, then tapering off. 76 could be some fog toward morning. Tomorrow, sunny to start the day hot, humid, then thunderstorms will end it some with downpours. Be careful, keep an eye to the sky and uh, an eye to the television station. Here we'll keep you posted. Southeast winds are 12 knots. Late Sunday and Monday, windy, and for the Columbus Day Regatta, the winds could be a factor on Sunday and cooling off. Back at 11. How about noon tomorrow at the Orange Bowl? Should be okay, Rick, but there may be rain or storms before the game is over. That's uh, third quarter, fourth quarter? Could be, yeah. All right, thanks. All right, and still ahead, first at 10 knots. Breast cancer and hot flashes. It may sound like things women need to worry about, but men can get them too. Find out how it happens and what you can do about it. Coming up. And a thrilling finish in the Mariners White Sox game this afternoon. The highlights, X. 7 News, brought to you in part by Bell Sound. Now, here's HealthCast with Marilyn Mitchell. Brittle bones, breast cancer, hot flashes. These are all health concerns for women only, right? Well, not necessarily. Check out males with female diseases. Oh, no, men don't get breast cancer, right? Men don't check themselves. We don't get this kind of stuff. And I've since found out that men do get breast cancer and men die from it, too. David Norlak learned that lesson three years ago when he was diagnosed with breast cancer. Like many women, he found a lump in his breast. Every year, 2,000 men get the same diagnosis. Men can be susceptible to breast cancer, just as they may be susceptible to testicular cancer. Breast cancer is caused by too much estrogen in the body. Men at greatest risk have family members with breast or ovarian cancer. Liver malfunction, which increases estrogen production and certain genetic disorders. Once diagnosed, treatment for men is the same as women. All of the treatment decisions we make generally come from taking the data in women and applying it to men. In fact, when it comes to breast cancer and other so-called women's diseases, there are very few studies or books devoted to men because the numbers are so low. That's why 43-year-old Jeffrey Sachs was so shocked to learn that he has osteoporosis. It's not something that you think about uh, as a man, as a young man. It's a song for older women. Uh, I know I, I saw it. Unlike Jeff, the signs of osteoporosis in many men are much more obvious. A hunched back, unexplained fractures, and hormone deficiency. If a man is deficient in testosterone, uh, he can lose bone more rapidly than usual. Men being treated for prostate cancer are also at higher risk because radiation and other treatments can decrease testosterone. For some, a new drug called Fosamax, used first in women, can help build bone mass. Just trying to keep his bones healthy by exercising, taking calcium supplements, and getting a bone scan every year. I'm fortunate that I've been told that I have this problem, and 
so there's something that I can watch. David is also thankful. He now shares his experience with other men. I feel great. <laughs> I really do. I'm just thankful to be here. Some experts even believe that men go through menopause because as they get older, they lose testosterone, causing mood swings, depression, and hot flashes. I'm Marilyn Mitchell, 7 News. Now the story's from the News Flex tonight. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has set up shop in South Florida to aid with this week's flood of trouble. But not everyone is getting the attention they deserve. Our live coverage continues at 11. And I'm Mikey Pasquale, live at the NCR Center. Big home opener tonight for the Panthers as they host the Canucks. But would Vancouver ruin the festivities? We'll have that and more coming up later in 7 Sports. Live at the NCR Center tonight, a big season home opener for the Panthers against the Vancouver Canucks. And remember that trade where Ed Jovanowski, then a Panther, went to Vancouver so we could get Pavel Bure. Well, both players factored in this one this evening. Stanley C. Panther making a grand entrance for tonight's big game. It's 2-1 Canucks in the first, and so much attention on Donald Brashear this evening. He beats Trevor Kidd, making it 3 0 Vancouver. Second period, Pavel Bure with six goals in the preseason, takes off with an assist from Igor Larionov. It's still 3-1 after two. Third period, Cats on the power play. Bury denied, but there's Larionov. Pouncing on the loose puck, scoring his first as a Panther. Bury assists, 3-2 Canucks. Dame score less than five minutes later. Cats, another power play. And Yaroslav splash hit, gets a slapper, tied it at three. We go to OT, back to haunt his former teammates. Jovanowski with the backhand. Canucks win 4-3. Here's the reaction from Jobo scoring the game winner. The puck was kept in, and I don't know how the puck, uh, some, I don't know if it was a pass or a, or a shot, but um, I was looking for Burry, and know Burry was kind of hanging out top there, and the puck came loose, and I just raced to it. And, um, and you know what, if I can try that move again, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. I think we were happy, and we showed some character and turned back, but uh, and then I kind of ran off the hook again in uh, overtime, but... Uh, I guess when you wake up into, up in the morning, uh, I still have one point is uh, other than that, we got to get off to a better start for against Boston, that's for sure. News around the NHL today centered on ex-Boston Bruin Marty McSorley found guilty of assault with a weapon and hockey stick on Canucks Donald Brashear last season. McSorley insisted the blow that sent Brashear to the ice wasn't intentional. The judge disagreed. He didn't give McSorley jail time but placed him on 18 months probation. Brashear is just glad he's all over. Lots of people uh, uh, had uh, uh, thought that it was me suing Marty McSorley, and uh, that's uh, it's a bad image uh, for me, and uh, I, I didn't really want to have that image, and I, I didn't really like that. So, uh, uh, I mean, it, I'm, I'm just glad everything's over with. Now, McSorley, who has been placed on probation, as we mentioned, cannot play against Brashear during that probation period. He has been suspended indefinitely by the NHL, and that's if and when he's reinstated by the league. Once again, the Cats uh, lose 4-3. Next up, Boston on Monday night. That'll do it for the NCR Center, and we ship it back to Steve Shapiro. All right, Mike, thank you very much. Huge sports weekend all around. Canes and Knowles meet tomorrow high noon. It's the 44th time they will play. FSU coach Bobby Bowden announcing just this afternoon injured quarterback Chris Wanky should be ready to go. Kane's fans getting ready by smashing anything in Noel's Garnet. I think he was a freshman the first time they played. Bobby and the Seminoles, they got to town around noon today. This year, for the first time in eight years, the Kane's and Noel's meet both ranked in the top ten. Bowden says it's just like old times. You don't even have to look at them to get that. You know, you do look at the ratings. You got number one versus number seven, or number two versus number seven. It's for which pool oh, you look at. That's the way it used to be, you know, so that's that's enough right there. High noon tomorrow. High school feature tonight, Ely and Stranahan. Ely and Green quarterback, Quincy Skinner, fakes out a highly skilled photographer, launches the bomb, Sterling Hicks, nobody near him. Ely leads the game 14-0. First half was all Ely. The big star for Ely, Tyrone Mock. He gets another TD run for Ely. This kid averages 12 yards per carry. Ely led 21-0. The game postponed for Lightning. They'll finish this tomorrow morning. The Heat, they hold an intra-squad scrimmage tonight in Boca Raton, and one of their new stars goes down. No, no, Tim. See, they gave you a new contract. You don't have to. Tim Hardaway to Dan Marley. Marley with the reverse. And look who was at the game. Jay Fiedler was there to see Anthony Mason. They're all friends from Long Island. 
Here it is, Eddie Jones on defense, he gets hurt. Sprains his right ankle, it is not thought to be serious. Eddie Jones gets up and he walks it off. Coming back at you, Anthony Carter to Don McLean. Don McLean had 21, but he hasn't had a hit song since American Pie. So he's practiced in Boca through Tuesday. And Seattle can sweep out Chicago, tied 1-1, bottom of the ninth. Seattle runner at third, Carlos Guillen with a surprise bunt single, scores Ricky Henderson, and Seattle eliminates Chicago in three straight. So now the Mariners advance. They will play either the Yankees or the A's. That series is tied 1-1. The Yankees are leading game one by uh, game three tonight as we speak. Rick and Murray, have a great weekend. Steve, always good to have you here on a Friday night. Thank you, sir. I'm happy to be here. And that'll do it for us, folks, at 10. 7 11 just getting started for you. 7 News brought to you in part by Bears for the best quality furniture and interior design.